John? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Hi. My name is David, and that's Sean. He's a lot more popular and famous than I am, at least part. <coughs> um, so, we'd like to know by show of hands, uh, who thinks drones are expensive toys? Fair enough. Who thinks drones are a nuisance in wilderness area? That's good. So we think drones are changing the game entirely. Um, these aerial robots can collect a huge amount of data uh, with the latest camera technology very quickly uh, compared to previously. Um, and uh, there are quite a few different drones available, different types. You get multi-rotor drones, uh, like a standard stuff, and you get ones that are more cinematog or used for cinematography, and uh, agricultural drones that can spray huge amounts of uh, pesticides or nutrients in areas. Then you get fixed-wing drones, which can fly a lot further, uh, collect a lot, lot more data, kind of difficult to fly. And then a mixture, a VTOL or a vertical takeoff and landing, which takes off like a multi-rotor but flies like a fixed wing. Now all of this technology comes from military, you know, military spec tech eventually trickles down to the civilian world. This is a FA-18 Super Hornet being refueled by a drone. It's a Boeing MQ-25T1 and it flies automatically and it refuels jets. Uh, this is a loyal wingman, it's made in Australia, also from Boeing, and it's, uh, it's a fighter plane. It flies totally autonomous and it doesn't experience the G-forces that your normal planes would experience or your pilots would experience, all while collecting data from the ground. So in the civilian world, however, uh, drones are commonly used for cinematography and photography. Uh, however, they are aerial robots and uh, okay, they have a lot more uses than just that. The payloads that drones can carry vary from red, green, blue cameras or RGB cameras like the ones you have on your mobile phone um, to specialized thermal cameras and multi-spectral cameras for inspection, security and plant health monitoring and then you get the large heavy lifter agro drones that can carry chemicals and spray various, uh, various chems as well as spread seeds out of a, a granular dispensing unit. So. How is it possible for these drones to be used to collect data um, or used as a collection tool and how is it precise? Well, there are flying robots, so in order to collect the consistent accurate data or precisely spray chemicals where they're needed, drones have to be pre-programmed with a flight path and um, the speed and altitude have to be set and the required data capture intervals or spray dosage and the target area needs to be set and then this is kind of an illustration of how, it's, how it flies. It takes off and then at every one of those flight dots uh, it takes a photograph. That's an aerial view down from where the photograph is taken and all of these images are overlapped on top of each other. So Mensa, who has heard of photogrammetry before? That's good. Photogrammetry is the science behind gathering or generating high resolution digital models and maps using overlapped raw image data. So as you saw those little photos that were taken just now, those are overlapped with an 80% front overlap and sometimes a 75% side overlap. So this kind of shows you how that works. On an area in the center you'll have an overlap of more than 13 images in the center. This allows measuring in three, in three dimensions. These images are processed through specialist software um, and they generate models using a method called structure from motion. So if you can see one point from 13 different angles, you can build structure out of it. And uh, overlapping the raw image data to produce geo-referenced orthomosaic maps, like this one, Digital surface models, which is a, a, a height representation of that map, and then you can strip away all of the trees, and you can just have the digital surface model. I'm oh, sorry, digital terrain model, as well as 3D point clouds can be generated. Really interesting stuff. Um, 
So there is a very large difference between an aerial photograph and an author mosaic map. A author rectified photo mosaic or an uh, author mosaic is broken down into two parts. An ortho, meaning straightened or a line, and mosaic, meaning piecing things together. These maps are geo-referenced, which means that they can be accurately overlaid onto Google Maps, and uh, with latitude and longitude uh, positions, and uh, every point on, on the map is referenced to a point on the Earth. It's like sending a pin on WhatsApp to somebody. You are geo-referencing yourself. These maps are geo-referenced just like that. Uh, the map or the images can contain a huge amount of data, metadata that can be used for various things. So, software that we use is Geographic Information System, or GIS system. It's an analytical computer system for capturing, storing, checking, and displaying data relating to a position on the Earth's surface. In the GIS world, the real world can be broken up into various layers, as you can see. These various layers you can extract information from. For example, an agronomist would be able to use the soil layer for good use, whereas the NSRI would make use of the flood plain layer for disaster management. One of the major types of file, GIS file formats is a raster file. And uh, it's used to store grids of pixels, including their individual GIS data that vary, such as color, elevation, and GPS coordinates. So that's every pixel has its own, its own GPS, its own elevation, and its own color. Now that's raster files, not raster. <laughs> so, using cameras attached to drones to collect raw image data that's overlapped, processing this data through specialist software to create maps and models, then extracting and analyzing environmental data with GIS to implement management planning in various sectors is why drones are tools and not toys. But why is it so accurate? Because of pixel size. So traditionally available to everyone, pixel size for land surveying was from satellite imagery. And the satellite imagery would have pixels that are two meters wide. I'm almost two meters tall, it's a massive pixel. So you can get a two centimeter ground sampling distance, or GSD, with a drone. This means that two square centimeter pixel is equivalent to two square centimeters on the ground. That's 10,000 more pixels per satellite pixel. If satellites are telescopes, then drones are microscopes. This is an example of, or taken at 70, uh, 70 meters above ground level, uh, with a front overlap of 80% and a side overlap of 75% to create or to achieve this accurate detail. Now that's a Google pixel in the middle there. That's, it's too big, you can't inspect accurately. This is the edge of one of our maps. It's a geo-reference author mosaic, and it's noticeable to see the difference between satellite imagery and imagery from a Phantom Pro. This really gives us a chance to extract much more data than was traditionally possible. Now, who remembers looking at their parents' TV when they were young and seeing those little dots, little red, green, and blue dots on the screen? Now, those are pixels, and uh, yeah, they were red, green, and blue. And together they produce white light, or visible light, which is just one part of the much broader electromagnetic spectrum we all love. <laughs> um, our eyes can detect wavelengths of between 400 and 700 nanometers. But the wavelength, there are wavelengths on either side of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can't see. And outside of our range of view are multispectral and hyperspectral and thermal, leading up. You can have your, your near-infrared camera straight on your drone. So multispectral cameras are commonly used for agriculture and plant health monitoring and analysis. These cameras, or this is a camera that's on a DJI multi-spec. And uh, when you take the, the light band, you can't see with the naked eye, like near-infrared. When a plant is stressing, it doesn't reflect as much of that near infrared light band, so you can't physically see that it's stressing, but the camera can, so you can give a lead time as to whether a plant is stressing or not. So, who can see 
the aloes growing in that part of... Is that carlisle? No, that's, yeah. The woolard. Yeah. We could see the aloes growing in the forest there. Can you see them now? How about now? All those dots are aloes that you can't see, but now you can. It's brilliant. So, with red, green, green blue, and multispectral, um, when you start modeling and you, and you take those different colors, you can, you can um, assign numbers to these colors and uh, produce value, you can produce values to produce indices. So these indices, all right, there's a, so there's a, a thermal image of firefighters fighting a uh, fire in a building and you, you're able to see where the hot parts are and you can fly a drone right over. Um, but with these indices, you get a renormalized difference or renormalized different vegetation index, which that's an RGB image, but if you fine tune it, you can see where plants are stressing or not. So you want to look for the red reflectance because the more green something is, the better it reflects red light or near infrared light. So we're able to accurately see where things are green, is unhealthy or something that's non living. And uh, something that's red is a, is a healthy living plant. So the renormalized difference vegetation index, that's the formula to work it out. And uh, there are quite a few different indices available. Um, if you just have an RGB camera, a normal consumer drone, you can work out all of these different indices, including the Pari index, um, the excess green index, green leaf index, and triangular greenness index. They have so many different purposes, chlorophyll content and nitrogen levels in trees and stuff. They're actually brilliant. Sean's going to get into a bit more detail about how things can be extracted from this, uh, this awesome technology. Thank you, Mr. Hello, ladles and jelly spoons. Thanks very much for coming. This is quite awesome. <laughs> nice to see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, too. Um, so we'll get stuck into some of the data that you can extract from drone imagery. Um, so there is quite a bit. So let's have a look at uh, some... Uh, this is a place out in the Flundefontein uh, in the Carlisville area. So uh, when it comes to conservation, you can look for quite a lot of stuff. So the purpose for this one was a trial to, to look at allo, uh, alloferrix. This is a small area, um, only 1.6 hectares and a sample distance of about one centimeter per pixel, so very, very accurate. So in, in conservation, we look at, uh, we often grid things out so we can do some further ground, ground shooting, so you can do that GI. Again, these are geo-reference grids as well, so you can replicate those in the real world. You can actually plot that individual grid accurately on the GPS, uh, just, just on the map. Okay, so let's have a closer look. So this is what the, the original image uh, looks like. And then from there, we, you can you can overlay you can strip out vegetation and separate it from soil values using this is an Atari index. So you can see the grey areas there and the dark areas that's representing vegetation. Everything in white there is soil. And then also just to highlight what you can pick out, those are the flowers of the aloes as well. And that's all got all of the information in that you need measurable data. So if we have a look at that, okay, so I'm skipping ahead a bit. Um, then also by using your digital terrain models and your digital surface models, you can subtract the two and actually get the height information from all of those plants within that, in that entire map. So all of those blue areas are, are carrying um, various bits of height information. Yeah, so let's have a look at some of the actual number numeric data that we can pull out of this. Um, so vegetation cover is about 9,000 meters, uh, square meters. So we'll cover over that entire area is around about 7,000 square meters. Um, there's 350 living aloes, 177 of which are flowering, 63 are dead. Um, average canopy height is around 2 meters, 2.9 meters. The, the tiny flowers on those plants average around about 49 square centimeters. So you need that sort of information, you can get it. And then in, in, the, in the individual grid blocks, so this one obviously looking at block number 40, there's 12 living plants, five of them are flowering, and the tallest one is around about 3 meters. So we can do that really quickly. Um, if you've ever done vegetation monitoring, you'll know how tedious it can be. If you stand outside in the sun with vegetation, it's quite, quite intense. 
So uh, that's just a graphic representation of the vegetation cover in that area. Yeah, we can also then include ground truthing data into, uh, um, into the model. So um, this can be used for agriculture as well. It's very, very useful. And also in construction. And, um, and we'll get into it a little bit. Again, get it out. But uh, if you have a look at this, that little dot over there in the drone map, that is what you're looking at on the ground. So you can include your ground photos into the models, and you can also then reference your field data into it as well. And all of that information on the side there is generated automatically by the computer software. It's a lot of information to gather in a very, very quick uh, space of time. So if you're looking at, uh, this is uh, insect feeding in this uh, particular part, so you can imagine if you're a farmer and you've got some stressing plants and stuff like that, you can go on the ground, have a look at it, incorporate it into your data, can run circles around everything, it's in, you can really use a lot, it saves a lot of time. And it's just a little bit more, it just tells you what cameras were used and the GPS coordinates of that particular plant as well. Okay, now we're going to get into the really fun stuff. So, um, Anne, can you just put your hand up, please? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, Dr. Anne Witt. This is an area that he's, uh, he's cleared, painstakingly he cleared a black bottle up in the Heights area. This is this this uh, sequence is going to follow a two-year recovery period. So this is the area that was cleared. It's around 2,400 square meters. As you can see, there's a lot of bare soil there because uh, natural vegetation doesn't really grow under any invasive species. Um, you can also see the stockpiles of the material there that that Arne took down. Now to enhance that, again, you can overlay an index. So everything in yellow is bare soil. Everything in green there is a representation of vegetation. This is six months later, after a bit, of, a bit more recovery. You can see it's a lot of uh, natural vegetation starting to come through, and that's enhanced there by the index, so you can see it very clearly. This is now 14 months later, but this is uh, where it gets a little bit tricky, so you've got to be careful. Um, so this is during the dry season, so there's, that's actually full vegetation, but if you look at the index, it's actually a representation no longer of soil, but of dry mass. Yeah. Other things you can pick up is how many B2 species have sprung up, and also game trails of, uh, of game starting to move through the area as well. There's 72 B2 species coming up, and here we can look at uh, what was actually happening over that, that period. So on the, in July of 2020, um, the percentage of vegetation cover was only 24%. That increased to, um, in uh, 14 months later, up to 98% vegetation cover. So it's a really, really good recovery rate. And that's what it looks like now. Thank you. Really appreciate the hard work that Arne put in there. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, this is just a graphic representation again. So anything below zero, that means there's a lot less vegetation than there uh, should be. And then again, 14 months later, everything's above zero between one. And it just shows you graphic representation. That's what it used to look like. That's all black wattle. Can't even get in there. And that's after only cleared. And there's a, you can see some erosion control going on there as well. That's what it looks like now. Yeah, drones can also be used to, to hunt down alien plants as well. So this is up in uh, also in the Heights area. Uh, this is granitic uh, granitic fainbos forest around here, and can actually detect yeah, very easily pick up uh, black wattles in the area as well. This is a representation of the, the terrain as well, so that's a tributary over there, and you can see where those those wattles are actually coming up over the property itself. So it helps for planning. It's very, very useful. This is probably my favorite part about drones and, and drone data, and using drone data. Um, using 3D point clouds to get uh, a lot of information out of, out of what you're looking at. So that's just a representation of how the drone is flown. Those are where all of the, the cameras are where the drones actually take the photographs of that particular house to build a three-dimensional model. You can strip out the colors then, and then you just, uh, you're just left with your height information. So you've got reds are your high points, blues are your crowns, and your greens in, in the middle. So if we go back to on these spots up there in, in heights, you can see vegetation is, is the, the taller vegetation over there is around about three meters. Everything else in between is between 70 and 1.5 meters tall. And this is a change detection model, which uh, they will get into more a bit later. But uh, if you have a look at those stockpiles, you can see they're in blue. Blue is a reduction. And that is because those piles have started to rot down. And then you can, so they are 
basically reduced over time, and then well, everything in red is where vegetation has actually come up. So it's also very useful in agriculture, but also construction as well. You can use those for quite a few things. Yeah, in terms of uh, doing erosion control modeling as well, we can then, as Dave mentioned earlier, you can strip away the trees so you can see the tributary running through there. And now we can start analyzing what's happening on the ground there. Um, so, example one is a 22% slope, so that means a very high percentage of runoff, so there's going to be a lot of erosion occurring there. Again, this is underneath um, alien vegetation, so not a lot of stuff holding the soil back. So if we take a side angle view of that, uh, that first example, you can see the trees, and you can see the terrain, the tallest trees around there, pine trees that are around about 25 meters tall. Strip those away, you've got your ground, and that's what it looks like from the side. It's very useful. So the areas that we're looking at are fairly small, but so this is just a representation of a 90 hectare plot, and there's a rugby field just to give you an idea. And this is collected, all of this information is collected in, in around 15 minutes. So doing that on the ground, you can imagine how long that's going to take you. <laughs> yeah, so if we're moving on to the, the heavy lift agricultural drones, obviously very useful in agriculture for flaying crops and, and uh, all sorts of good stuff, orchards and things like that. They're, they're a lot more precise than helicopters and, and uh, conventional aircraft. They don't blanket spray, they're much more precise, so you use a lot less pesticides going, so it's a lot better for the environment in that sense as well. So that's what it looks like afterwards, after being hit within the act drone. And then we can look at some numeric data as well. There's a little bit cut off there at the bottom, but there's, there's, a, there's bits of information in there as well that we can deduce. So if you have a look at this graph, that's what it was. Um, these are, that's how many trees or the, the canopy average heights before the spray. That's it afterwards. Big reduction there. And if we just go back quickly, I just want you to take note that on the edges there, that's all natural vegetation that hasn't been hit. So the collateral damage is very, very low. Now we get into other really cool stuff. So artificial intelligence is quite a big thing that's coming into the into the drone world now. Um, and into just conventional life. I mean, your everyday technology uses a lot of AI. So if you've got a really large area and you want to know how many trees are there, for example, if you've got an orchard, you want to know how many trees are there, or if you've got people, you want to know how many people you've got in the area, you can actually train the algorithms to start looking for those specific things in the environment. So here we've got some pine trees. And what the algorithm does, once you've taught it, it will actually pick those out on its own. And so it learns by itself. And that also gives you the area information of those. So if we have a look at um, the information that comes out of that, there's 538 uh, trees that, that the algorithm detected. Um, the, the smallest area uh, was about three centimeters over there, and the largest one is 4.2 square meters in terms of canopy and every size. So it does that for you very quickly. Also gets used in construction quite a lot. Um, this saves a huge amount of time in terms of being able to detect a lot of um, you know, cracks in the road, for example, all of those will be give uh, numeric data in terms of the area, you know, how much, so that gives you how much time, how much material you're going to need to use, and um, it just, yeah, it saves a lot of time and a lot of money, and it saves construction engineers, and, and, and that's uh, quite a lot. It can be done a lot quicker. Okay, so it's not restricted to single you know, images or maps. Uh, there's a company overseas that is uh, Conservation AI, They've actually developed algorithms that automatically detect wildlife but using live stream video feed. Yeah, so that that is there giving you obviously your Loxodonta africana, your African elephant, it's, uh, and um, it's going to you can do counts, you can do age classing as well. So you know, youngsters, middle age, older, as the drone flies. So you can literally tell the program the drone where to go, and it will just catch everything. I'm using the artificial intelligence. That's really important. Um, this has also been used um, in the UK for law enforcement and probably all over the world. Everybody on social media is uploading their, their photos to the internet. They take that information, they stick it through a drone, and they'll pick you out of a crowd very, very quickly. So Big Brother's watching and we get to that. Um, yeah, so it's quite interesting stuff. I'm going to hand back over to Dave and he's going to get into some change detection stuff quickly. Thank you. 
if I'm speaking to the mic properly. Can you guys hear me properly? Yeah. Great stuff. All right, so change detection using 3D point clouds is uh, it's, it's great. You can you can see changes in little area, or you can change, see little changes in big areas. So this is a section of the Serpentine River in uh, wilderness, and uh, there's a, a back mighty's infestation that's encroaching. And uh, we've taken two samples from three months apart. There's the first one. There's the second one. And you can overlay them on top of each other to see the differences. So you can see over there, and there's a, a graphic representation of, of how things have, have increased in size, including the alien vegetation. So this is good for urban planning and monitoring uh, to establish where infrastructure has been put up um, or taken down. Uh, this is the largest section of the river, and uh, if we overlay that, those point clouds on top of each other, we put the change detection onto the author mosaic. You can see that there's been an encroachment of that alien species, that Phragmites, um, by between 90 and 100 centimeters all along the river's edge. Um, this is from the dry season to the wet season, so it's a notable difference. Uh, change detection can be seen in urban areas, so you can see who's been good and put sun pan or solar panels on their roofs, um, <laughs> uh, who's chopped away some, some trees, a municipality might have taken away some trees from the road's edge there, um, somebody bought a new car. <laughs> um, uh, it can be expanded into a whole city where you can see the changes uh, in these models. Now in construction, construction is actually adopting drone technology, or they're, they're the fastest adopters of drone technology in, in all industries. Drones are able to help um, unload and improving the, um, the construction site. For example, uh, increased accuracy in reporting and uh, volumetric analysis can accurately tell you that that is 10 cubic meters of sand. And um, identifying hazards and improving security and cutting costs by increasing efficiency, um, whether it be volumetric analysis or stockpiles or uh, essential materials that need to be tracked, where's your equipment, everything. Cut and full requirements are quite easily completed with these uh, 3D point clouds. You can measure volumes easily take measurements within a one centimeter accuracy with the 3D models that are built, which is almost more accurate than a really cheap uh, measuring device, like a, one that uh, if you bought can build it. Um, other uses for drones, you can, you can spy on people. I'm just joking. You can, uh, you can see if people are illegally fishing down the river, illegal netters. Um, <laughs> Uh, deforestation is quite a serious issue. We can monitor that um, in agriculture and in urban spaces. Wilderness is experiencing a, experiencing a massive housing development where houses are being built in sensitive areas without due consideration to the environment and lack of restriction enforcement. And uh, we can also measure whales. <laughs> um, whale monitoring like, uh, like our friend uh, Bill Raymond. So he's traveled the world measuring the same species whale up and down, gathering some quite, quite good information. Drones can be used in emergency situations, dropping off first aid kits and uh, flotation devices. Um, there are also drones that can't crash and fly them through, uh, through caves where people have gone missing and, and they, they won't stop flying, they can't get caught up in anything more. It's really interesting stuff. There's a ton of other uses, um, I won't get into all of them, the sky is literally the limit. <laughs> um, but when it comes to, to licensing and regulations, there's a ton of stuff that you need to do in order to get above board and to be able to, to legally fly in South Africa. If you, want to, if you want to start off, you need to get your pilot's license. This involves getting your aviation medical free, your restricted radio license, you need to do your remote pilot theory exam, you need to do your practical, you need to get your aviation security certificate, your drain dangerous goods, police clearance, and all of the other ratings involved. Then you've got to approach the Civil Aviation Authority to get your ROC. This is quite challenging. It's, it's, uh, it's literally opening up an airline. Um, you approach the Department of Transport and you tell them, I want my air service license, and then you start the process. And it's, it's tons and tons and tons of paperwork. It's financially extortionate, it's very impractical, it's extremely time consuming, and the rest of the world is just doing it completely differently. In Australia, you can get yours done in 
24 hours. South Africa takes you three years. And uh, yeah. we don't want to operate illegally, so we, we go through the process. It's just a lot, a lot more difficult. And I'm not going to get into too much.